uh, 1 Kings chapter 13, and uh, I see the hour is late, and uh, praise the Lord, I will have a respect for your time, and uh, I promise you we'll be out of here by 10 o'clock tonight, and uh, praise the Lord. Uh, 1 Kings chapter 13, it's a simple message, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to preach a message on the King James Bible. There was uh, a man of God out of Judah. Uh, he was given the word of the Lord. He was commanded to go to Bethel. And uh, he was commanded to go to the king, King Jeroboam, who stood on the altar to burn incense. And uh, he was commanded to give him the word of the Lord. By the way, the word that he gave him was quick. The word that he gave him was powerful. The word that he gave him was life-changing. And uh, the king didn't believe the word, didn't like the word. And uh, the king put forth his hand against the man of God right there. And the king's hand began to wither. And, and as you read this story, the word, uh, it, it, wasn't Jer it wasn't the man of God's word. It was the word of the Lord. Amen. And the word of God is quick. It is powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It changes life. And God's used his word from the beginning of time to today. And uh, I believe God has given us his word, preserved his word, and the word is in the King James Bible. And uh, the story will go a little bit further because that same man of God was told not to eat or to drink in the land of Israel. And he gets out of Bethel, begins to head back down to the Judah, and uh, another man of God, an older man of God, heard what had happened. And the man, uh, the other man of God began to go over there and he said, hey, hey, why don't you come over to my house and why don't you come over and get some food and, and some water? And the man of God who was originally went up to Bethel right there says, no, I can't. I can't do it. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not allowed to. The word of the Lord told me that I'm not allowed to eat or drink until I get back to Judah. And he said, no, 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 you don't understand. Uh, I have the word of the Lord. I was told that you're to come to my house. And you're to get uh, some food and some water. And the man of God listened to what was called the word of God, which really wasn't the word of God. It was a counterfeit. Yes, and that counterfeit word of God caused death to him. Because he did go and he did eat, but God killed him. Yes, sir. And we look at that. The word of God is quick and powerful. Yes, and even a man of God that begins to go against the word of God and is tricked into a false version of the Bible can be led to death quickly. And if you'll stand with me for the reading of God's Word, we'll read these first, uh, first 10 verses. We'll read them responsibly. I'll read verse number 1. We'll read every other verse until we get to verse number 10. But 1 Kings chapter 13, verse number 1. And behold, there came a man of God out of Judah by the word of the Lord unto Bethel. And Jeroboam stood by the altar to burn incense. And he cried against the altar in the word of the Lord. And said, O altar, altar, thus saith the Lord, Behold, a child shall be born unto the house of David, Josiah by name. And upon thee shall he offer the priests of the high places that burn incense upon thee, and men's bones shall be burnt upon thee. And he gave a sign the same day, saying, This is the sign which the Lord hath spoken. Behold, the altar shall be rent, and the ashes that are upon it shall be poured out. And it came to pass, when King Jeroboam heard the saying of the man of God, which had cried against the altar in Bethel, that he put forth his hand from the altar, saying, Lay hold on him. And his hand, which he put forth against him, dried up, so that he could not pull it in again to him. The altar also was rent, and the ashes poured out from the altar, according to the sign which the man of God had given by the word of the Lord. And the king answered and said unto the man of God, Entreat now the face of the Lord thy God, and pray for me, that my hand may be restored me again. And the man of God besought the Lord, and the king's hand was restored him again, and became as it was before. And the king said unto the man of God, Come home with me, and refresh thyself, and I will give thee a reward. And the man of God said unto the king, If thou wilt give me half thine house, I will not go in with thee, neither will I eat bread nor drink water in this place. For so was it charged me by the word of the Lord, saying, Eat no bread, nor drink water, nor turn again by the same way that thou camest. 
So he went another way and returned not by the way that he came to Bethel. And the story will continue there, but all the word of the Lord, powerful, the word of the Lord, uh, transforming, changing lives and working. And the man of God simply preached the word of God, followed the word of God. And wow, what a victory was given. And I believe the word of God is still alive today and it's found in the King James Bible. We'll pray and we'll get going further. Dear Father in heaven, we love you. Thanks, Lord, for being a good God that still works in 2018. Thank you for our church, and I do love the people here. And uh, what Brother Bosha said uh, is so true. Boy, we should never take it for granted that we have you in our presence, and we're serving you, and you're working in the midst of us. It's a good place to be, Lord. And God, I pray that you continue to give us uh, unity as a church around you. Help us to be unified around your word. Lord, I pray that you bless us this evening in Jesus' name. Amen. Ah, uh, you ever read the Bible, and as you're reading it, you, you begin to, to start thinking, and you, you know the end of the story, and you want to say, no, no, don't. You know the end of the story. Please don't do that. Uh, don't do it. And you begin to cheer and, and try to, you know what's going to happen, but you're saying, no. And, and the end of the story of this is simply clear. The man of God preached the word to Jeroboam. Jeroboam's hand withered and uh, victory, victory, victory. But victory turned into defeat very quickly. Uh, he began to go back uh, on his way. And uh, there was another man of God who heard about, he was an old prophet in Bethel, and he heard about this man of God, and uh, he went and uh, met him and said, I want you to come home with me. And the man said, no, I've got to go back to Judah. And he said, no, come home, eat bread. And uh, he said, now it's sold me by the word of the Lord that uh, I'm a prophet. Uh, the word of the Lord told to me that you should come eat bread and drink water in my house. And it says in the word of God, chapter 13, verse 18, but he lied unto him. The old prophet from Bethel lied. He said, the word of the Lord, but it was a lie. He quoted, quote, unquote, the word of the Lord, but it truly wasn't the word of the Lord. And the whole story is that man did go back and eat, but eventually he disobeyed the word of the Lord, the true word of the Lord. He was deceived by the devil. He was deceived by the trickery of a, quote, unquote, Bible or a, quote, unquote, truth that was really untruth. And eventually, a lion met him in the way and slew him. And why? Because he was disobedient to the true word of the Lord. And it's a short sermon. It's not a, a big, uh, long sermon. But God has promised to preserve his word. Amen. Uh, God has promised to preserve his word. Psalm chapter 12, it says, The words of the Lord are pure words. Then it says, Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. And God has promised to preserve his word, and I believe he has preserved his word. As you begin to look at the Bible, and you look at that statement, it is written. It is written. We often will quote that from Matthew chapter 4, but I was amazed when I looked it up. That, that, quote, that statement is found over 80 times in the Bible. It is written, not it was written. And by the way, there's a difference. It was written. Many people say, yeah, we have the Bible in the originals, and uh, we can go back and look for the originals, but nobody has the originals. But I say it is written today, and it is written in the English language in the King James Bible. It is written. It is written. And I have page after page after page of it is written, and I was going to quote all 80 verses of that. And I'm not going to quote those, but just say with me one time, it is written. We solved those 80 verses and moved on in the sermon. Praise God. Uh, but I'm going to say that it is written in the King James Bible. The King James Bible is the word of the Lord. And we need the Bible. We need an every word Bible. We need a Bible that we can believe, we can trust, we can say it is our final authority. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 15 through 17, it says, And that from a child... Thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, the Holy Scriptures, these words, uh, which are able to make thee wise into salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. And as you begin to think about that, it says all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. 
and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished into all good works. But, but it is written, and we have the word of God. Therefore, we have a word of God that we can trust, we can go to for salvation, that we can go to for correction, that we can go to for reproof, that we can go to for instruction in righteousness. And the Bible we have today is the King James Bible. I'll get more into that, but many people will uh, then throw up a sign like this. King James Onlyanism, and they'll begin to criticize somebody who believes in just the King James Bible. And here's what they'll say: the chief argument to prove King James uh, King James Bible Onlyism is to attack the NIV. They attack it by showing the NIV has allegedly "quote unquote" omitted words based on the King James Bible as the standard of correctness. That is an example of both an uh, that is a, an example of both a, an assumption and faulty logic. For it assumes the it assumes the King James Bible is the sole source of accuracy without proof and fails in its goal of discrediting one single translation. Perhaps uh, for perhaps the King James Bible has added those words. Attempting to discredit any one single translation doesn't logically prove the King James Bible is superior over all other translation, nor does it prove the King James Bible is the only word of God. Therefore, you ought not just believe the King James Bible. And that's their argument right there. They'll say, you King James Bible people who believe that are nuts, are fruit kegs, uh, that you're narrow-minded, and who are you to say that you have an every word Bible? By the way, when you get down to it, the people who attack the King James Bible don't believe that a real Bible exists. That's what it boils down to. They believe there's no real, true Bible without errors anywhere on this earth. We're different. We believe the Bible says that God was going to preserve his word, and I believe he did in the King James Bible. By the way, the King James Bible, I already said it earlier, was the common Bible used for over 350 years. Nobody ever questioned it. They just used it. Boy, the revivals under the preaching of the King James Bible. Souls saved through preaching the King James Bible. Uh, churches planted uh, with preaching from the King James Bible. God's blessing, holy living, missionaries sent out. Then, in the 1970s, things began to change. And you could go back a little bit further, like Brother Bosch did, the living Bible, the good news for modern man, but nobody used those. But we get to the 1970s and 1980s, and people did start using the NIV. People did start using the, uh, the, the New King James Bible, and it began to divide churches. No longer could churches have responsive reading. Then it began to question the authority of God's Word. Uh, church members, rather than going out and giving out the gospel, began to squabble over the Word of God. Therefore, pastors eventually got to the point where, hey, instead of having pew Bibles or Bibles in the pew, we're going to put them on the screens because nobody has the Bible anymore. And it became a confusing symbol right there, you might say. And God is not the author of confusions. Amen. Now, uh, the NIV, I'm going to attack it tonight. Amen. I'm going to say that it is not the Word of God. Amen. Uh, two counterfeit Bibles sold today, and really, uh, there are more, but really two stand out predominant in the last 20, 30 years, the NIV and the New King James Bible. The NIV seems to be the second most sold Bible, or uh, about, the, about the most sold Bible in the world today, the NIV, the New International Version. And Genesis chapter 1, uh, we find the story of the serpent. It says, now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Yay, hath God said, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And how did, how did Satan attack Eve? How did Satan attack Adam? Through the word of God. He said, hath God said? And he began to quote the word of God, but changed it just slightly. Began to quote the word of God, but twisted it just a little bit. And, and what we realize is the best lie is a version of the truth. Pastor, how do you know that? I have kids. <laughs> <laughs> it's a true statement right there. The best lie is just a, a version of the truth. And we know a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. And uh, the NIV is a version that is missing 64,000 words. Uh, if you were to turn to Matthew chapter 17, verse 21, 
For the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost, completely omitted out of the new international version. Matthew chapter 23, verse 14, completely gone. Matthew chapter 7, verse 4, uh, 16, completely gone. Uh, Mark chapter 9, verse 44, completely gone. Mark 9, 46, Mark 11, 26, Mark 15, 28, Luke 17, 36, John 5, 3 and 4, uh, Acts chapter 15, verse 34, Acts 24, verses 6 through 8, Acts 28, verse 29, Romans 16, verse 24, uh, completely omitted from the NIV. By the way, uh, those are complete verses. If you looked at the NIV, half of verses are omitted all over the place. Words are omitted all over the place. Uh, the uh, New International Version is a confusing version of the Bible. Well, Pastor, how do you know that? Well, back when I was in the Navy, I remember very clearly when I first began to realize it. I was sitting in my, uh, my shop and I was witnessing to a man. He was a man who believed in a works salvation and we began to talk about how uh, baptism and the importance of baptism. And he said, in order to get baptized, you need to become a disciple of Christ. You need to live for the Lord. And he quoted Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20, which uh, in the NIV says, go ye therefore make disciples of all nations. Baptizing. He said, look at my version of the Bible says you need to become a disciple. After you become a disciple, you can get baptized. I said, whoa. I said, calm down. Let's look at another portion of scripture. Let's go to the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts chapter 8. And we began to go over there, and I began to read it. And uh, the Ethiopian eunuch, uh, Philip, jumped onto the chariot, and he looked at him reading the Bible. He said, understandest what thou readest. And he said, how can I except some man should guide me? And he took him at the same place of scripture, preached to him Jesus. And they came to a certain water. And the Ethiopian eunuch had said, see, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And for sake of not misquoting it, I'm going to read out of Acts chapter, uh, Acts chapter, well, here it's right here. Acts chapter 8, verse 37. And Philip said, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I Believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Amen. And I got done reading verse 37, and the man said, that's not there. I said, what do you mean it's not there? He said, you just read something that's not in the Bible. And, and I went and looked at his Bible, and the NIV, his Bible went from verse 36, skipped over to verse 38. And, and it changed doctrine. It changed what somebody believed. It shocked me. I couldn't believe it. I said, whoa, there's a problem here. When you have different uh, words uh, written right here, it leads to different belief systems. Right. And right there, he had a different Bible right there, which completely transformed his belief system. And I said, wow, has the devil deceived a lot of people. Yeah, and boy, I want to just say the NIV Bible is a deception. Does it have some of God's words? Yeah, I'd say it has some. But I don't want some, I want all. And we can have the Word of God in the King James Bible. Well, Pastor, what about the new King James Bible? And uh, you got to listen to Al Lacey and uh, the new King James Bible. And he, it's a very good sermon. You'll listen to that hopefully in the next couple of days. But the new King James Bible, supposedly they just took the these and the thous out of the King James Bible. And you can go to the new King James Bible and just updated a few simple words. You can trust the new King James Bible finished in 1982. But the, NI, the new King James Bible omits the, Lord's, the, Lord, the Lord 66 times omits God 51 times. The New King James Bible omits heaven 50 times. Uh, takes out the word repent 44 times. Omits the blood. By the way, it's the blood. Hey, praise God for the blood of Jesus Christ that uh, cleanses us from all sin. It omits the blood 23 times. It takes the word hell out 22 times. It omits uh, the word Jehovah entirely. By the way, Jehovah witnesses, whenever you witness to them, they'll say, I don't like your Bible because it takes Jehovah out of it. I'll say, no, it didn't. We have Jehovah in our Bible. By the way, the word Jehovah is in our Bible. Amen. Jehovah God's in there. But what they're referring to is all the corrupt versions of the Bible because most of the people they witness to have a corrupt version of the Bible that does not have the word Jehovah in there. But if you've got a King James, it does. Right. And boy, it's nothing uh, to be criticized, right? The New King James Bible admits Jehovah and it admits the word damnation entirely. It works, uh, admits the word devils entirely out of the whole New King James Bible. Um, it, it's crazy. The New King James Bible demotes the deity of Jesus Christ. Instead of calling him Lord, they call him Sir. And it, where it says in Mark chap, Matthew chapter 18, verse 26, and worshipped him, saying, Lord, 
Uh, the New King James Bible says, before him saying, Master. Completely takes out worshiping Jesus. Uh, it says in Matthew 20, verse 20, in the King James Bible, worshiping him. Matthew 20, 20, in the New King James Bible says, kneeling down. And by the way, there's a big difference. Yeah. Yeah. Jesus was worthy to be worshiped because he's God. But the New King James Bible lowers the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ, and it changes things. Well, it's just a little change, Pastor. Yes, it may be little, but little changes lead to different directions. Ask Eve back in Genesis chapter 3. Uh, New King James Bible uh, supports uh, different ideas like a work's salvation. Matthew chapter 7, verse 14, straight is the gate, narrow is the way. By the way, narrow is the way. There is one way. It's narrow. It's Jesus and Jesus alone. Amen. But it certainly isn't difficult, is it? Boy, the simplicity that is in Christ, it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3. But the New King James Bible takes narrow as the way and says difficult is the way. And why do they believe that? Because they believe in a works salvation that is Jesus plus somebody else. And you can continue on there. And I want you to go one uh, section of Scripture, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I want to show you something. We will not be long, much longer. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, this is written to believers, believers in the Corinthian church. And uh, he was, uh, this, as you read this, it, it tells the gospel. It speaks of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, whereby ye are saved, praise the Lord. And it's mentioning the saved folks there in, Corinth, in the Corinth. And you get to verse 42, it begins to speak of the resurrection. This also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. Okay? When you die, you're sown in corruption. You're, you go to the grave, but you're raised out of the grave incorruptible. And it goes on. It is sown in dishonor, but it says it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. And there is a death, but there is a resurrection. Yeah. You do go to the grave, but boy, praise God for the resurrection, the, eventually that new glorified body. And it continues all the way through there. And uh, you get to verse 54. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. By the way, death is going to be swallowed up in victory. One day we're going to say, oh, death, where is thy sting? Oh, grave, where is thy victory? Woo, glory, we're going to be in glory in heaven. Amen. Written to believers. Yes, oh, grave, where is thy victory? There's no victory of the grave. Now, the New King James Bible, verse 55, it changes, oh, death, where is thy sting? Oh, grave, where is thy victory? To, oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, Hades... Oh, Hades, where is your victory? Hades, another word for hell, they would try to say. But does a Christian, when he dies, go to hell? Boy, it's a corrupt version. It's corrupt. That's one of hundreds of changes that the New King James Bible or perversion leads to. Well, we don't go to hell. We don't go to Hades. Do we go to the grave? Yes. But praise God, we're saved. We're coming up and out of that grave. Amen. Amen. Hey, conclusion. People, uh, and this is interesting. Just use the King James Bible. Amen. I don't preach on the King James Bible very often, and we just use it. Amen. We just use it. People naturally led to the King James Bible after about a week or two. They get rid of their uh, different versions and begin to use the King James Bible because that's the only way they can read the Bible with us. It's normal. I'm not King James ugly, but I believe it is the Word of God. But listen to this. This is interesting. I found an article, and uh, the article is uh, the most popular and fastest growing Bible translation isn't what you think it is. And there's an, a survey, the NIV versus the King James Bible uh, surveyed, suggested that the translation that uh, most Americans are reading is actually not the bookstore bestseller. And uh, there's some dispute, and different people will say different things, but most people will say that the NIV is the most bought or sold translation today. And, uh, but this article is saying that though the NIV is, so, is sold more than the King James Bible, well, I'll read it. The most popular and fastest growing Bible translation isn't what you think it is. 
When Americans reach for their Bibles, more than half of them pick up a King James Bible. Amen. According to a new study uh, advised by respected historian Mark Knoll, the 55% who read the King James Bible easily outnumber the 19% who read the New International Version. And the percentages drop into the single digits for competitors such as the New Revised Standard Version, the New American Bible, and the Living Bible. And the article goes to consider, it says, though some other versions seem to sell a lot, in the end, the ones that are actually read is the King James Bible. Why? No, no, here's why. Because people who read the King James Bible believe it's the Word of God. We don't doubt it. We believe it. We then are a King James Bible church. What are we doing? We have a Bible Sunday where we encourage people to read the Bible. So in the end, who reads the Bible? The people who have the King James Bible. And the people who have those other versions of the Bible, they're taught by their pastors, their teachers, that there's errors all over it. And the only place they're really going to get it figured out is the leaders of the churches, the Nicolaitans, you might say, the Lord, people lording over the laity. So why read it anyways? But we do have the Word of God, the King James Bible, that you are given by a gift by the Almighty God, that you can read it, you can believe it, you can use it. Praise God. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we love you. Shorter sermon, and uh, that man of God, man, he had your power. Uh, he had your word, and uh, he had your blessing. And uh, that other man of God, that old prophet from Bethel, uh, lied to him and told, told him that he had the word of the Lord, and he didn't. And uh, that man who fell, uh, was deceived, was killed by that lion because he, went, he disobeyed you, God. Help us to be people that just stick with the book, the King James Bible. Help us to be people that believe it, that read it, that study it. And as a church, help us to never swerve from that area, Lord. And I pray that we be united about that. Every head bowed and every eye closed. How many of you this evening would just say, Pastor, I'm, I'm on board with the King James Bible. If you just raise your hand as a testimony.